10. On the Distant Approaches The Germans had selected the tilsit riga Highway as one of the main avenues of their thrust toward Leningrad. The highway crossed the Soviet-German border at a town called Torigi on the Ura River. Torigi held a central position in the shield, which was being created by Colonel General F. I. Kuznetsov's Special Baltic Military Command as a protection against any thrust toward Leningrad across the Baltic states. This command, set up after the absorption of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union in the summer of 1940, was supposed to hold back an attack hundreds of miles to the west of Leningrad. Despite its obvious importance, Turgi was garrisoned on the evening of June 21st, only by special police border troops rather than by regular Red Army units. Sometime during the evening, a border patrol intercepted a letter which said that the Germans planned to attack either Saturday night or Sunday morning. At about 2 a.m., June 22nd, Lieutenant General Golovkin of the Border Force ordered his men to battle stations. They could plainly hear the noise of heavy machines, obviously tanks, across the river. It was a cool night and quiet except for the clank of heavy equipment on the German side where no lights were showing. At 4 a.m. came a roar like thunder. A shell smashed into the command post at Torigi, and a second knocked out the switchboard. Over a field telephone came a cry from a border sentry. Ahsoka calling! Ahsoka calling! Germans have crossed the frontier! This is Ahsoka! It's war! I see tanks! Many tanks! The border guards blew up the bridge across the Ura, but did not have the strength to offer much opposition. In the Commandant's office, they were busy burning secret papers and getting the money out of the office safe. At about 2 p.m., the frontier guards managed to make their way to Skodville about seven miles east of Torgi. Low-flying Nazi planes strafed them, and they fired back with pistols and machine guns. They had no anti-aircraft weapons. Not until 4 p.m. did they get their first communication from the regular Red Army Command. It was a message from 125th Division Headquarters, ordering them to set up roadblocks to liquidate the Nazi intruders, to hold up disorganized units and soldiers, and halt the spread of panic. The description of the Germans as intruders suggested that even 12 hours after the war had started, the 125th Division commander was not sure Russia really was at war. The border guards did their best with the intruders, but it wasn't easy, one survivor recalled. The weight of the Nazi attack was so heavy that it simply crushed many Soviet units in its path. This was the fate of the 125th Division. It was attacked by three German armored divisions of the 4th Nazi Panzers and three infantry divisions. It fell apart. Within hours it had no tanks, hardly any anti-aircraft guns, little transport, and was running out of hand grenades. Helplessly, it staggered back to the rear. The 125th Division was part of the Soviet 11th Army, which was commanded by Lt. Gen. Vasily Morozov, a handsome, quiet, self-controlled, mustached officer of great experience. He had an able staff, headed by Major General Ivan T. Schlemen and Ivan V. Zuviev, a political commissar who had served in Spain. The Soviet 11th Army was one of three which made up the Baltic military command of Colonel General F. I. Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov was a very senior Red Army officer, but he had never seen active combat. His chief of staff was Lt. General P. S. Klinov, and his military commissar was P. A. Dibrov. The Germans possessed a superiority over Kuznetsov of about 3 to 1 in infantry and 2 to 1 in artillery. In armor, the two forces were roughly equal. Footnote. The authoritative Soviet study of the Baltic campaign gives the German superiority as 1.66 to 1 in divisions, 1.3 to 1 in armor, 1.8 in weapons, 1.3 to 1 in armor, 1.8 to 1 in weapons, 1.37 to 1 in planes. End of footnote. However, the figures were deceptive. Kuznetsov had dispersed his troops widely through the whole Baltic area. Many units were 100 to 300 miles to the rear. Only seven divisions were in the frontier region, and most of them had only one regiment in line, the rest being in barracks and camps 25 or 30 miles away. This reflected the general situation on the Western Front, where a total of 170 Soviet divisions facing the Germans, only 56 were in the first echelon on June 22nd. Not only were troops badly positioned, 
Stalin specifically had refused requests by Kuznetsov to concentrate his forces on the frontiers. But the fortified regions on the new state borders were far from complete, only 50% by one estimate. Many heavy forts were not due to be ready until 1942 or even 1943. A visitor on the eve of June 22nd was shocked to find Baltic frontier works, which supposedly had been finished, but had no weapons in place except for a few gun positions fitted out for show to inspectors sent out from Moscow. Kuznetsov frontier commanders were excellently informed as to German forces concentrated across the border from their lines. Often they knew not only the numbers but the designations of the units and the names of German commanders, but they could not obtain orders to position their troops properly to meet an attack. Nor did Colonel General Kuznetsov have any detailed plan of action in event of German attack. It was no accident that the very suggestion to set up plans to defend his Riga general headquarters struck him as unthinkable. Like most commanders in the field, as well as the Supreme Command in Moscow, he was dominated by Stalin's official doctrine that war will be fought on alien territory with a minimum of bloodshed. This thesis had been preached for years both in the military academies and the Communist Party. The Soviet army, the Soviet government, and the Soviet people had become accustomed to thinking that if war came, their armies would strike quickly to the west and carry the attack to the enemy. Comparatively, little attention had been given to the defense tactics, or to problems which might be encountered as the result of Nazi blitzkrieg tactics. Thus, Colonel General Kuznetsov was by no means ready militarily or psychologically for the crisis which arose. Many, possibly half, of his officers were on leave. More than half the border units were under strength and had only a fraction of the arms and equipment called for by the table of organization. Almost all Kuznetsov's tanks were old models, 1,045 out of a total of 1,150, and 75% of these needed repairs. Three-quarters of his planes were five or more years old, and almost unserviceable. Many guns had no mechanized transport, and most of them were not powerful enough to match the German artillery or German tanks. In the 12th Mechanized Corps, 16% of the tanks were out of service, being repaired. In the Third Corps, the percentage was 45. An authoritative estimate placed only five of the 30 divisions which saw service on the Northwest Front as fully equipped. The remainder were 15-30% to 30 below level in personnel and equipment. The new fortified system was not complete. The old installations in the Peskov Ostrov area had been dismantled. The new airfields had not yet been finished, and many old ones were being reconstructed. There was a shortage of shells, ammunition, and spare parts. The situation prevailed throughout the Soviet army. When Marshal A. I. Yeremenko took command of the 3rd Mechanized Corps, he found it had only 50% of its authorized tanks, mostly old T-26. He had hardly any new T-34s, which became the workhorses of World War II, and only two new KV-60 ton tanks, which were superior to anything the Germans possessed. The 7th Mechanized Corps, constituted on July 1st, had 40 of its rated 120 kV tanks and none of the rated 420 T-34s. The Western Front entered the war with 60% of its allotted rifles, 75% of its mortars, 80% of its AA guns, 75% of its artillery, 56.5% of its tanks, and 55% of its trucks. The ratios in Kuznetsov's Special Baltic District were about the same. General Kuznetsov had available for the protection of Leningrad's approaches two principal armies, the 8th, commanded by Major General P.P. Slobenikov, and the 11th, commanded by Lieutenant General V.I. Morozov, and the understrength 27th Army, commanded by Major General A.Y. Barazin. The 27th Army was located east and north of the Davina. The 8th Army defended the coastal sector, which was attacked by the 18th German Army. The 11th Soviet Army was just to the south, where it met the brunt of assault by the German 16th Army. The heaviest blow of the 4th German Panzers struck at the hinge of the 8th and 11th Soviet Armies. The German intelligence estimated Kuznetsov's forces at 28 divisions, including 2 armored, 2 cavalry, and 6 mechanized. Footnote John Erickson, author of The Soviet High Command, estimates them at 28 rifle divisions, 3 mechanized corps, 4 cavalry divisions, 7 mechanized brigades, 1,000 tanks, 
Pavlov gives the figures as 12 rifle, 2 motorized, 4 armored. Orlov makes it 22 divisions, including a separate rifle brigade. And a footnote. Because of the indecisiveness of Colonel General Kuznetsov and his reluctance to give precise instructions, there was a vast variation in the state of preparedness of his subordinate commands on the eve of the war. Lieutenant General Morozov of the 11th Army had been convinced that war was coming, and coming very soon. Acting on his own initiative, Morozov ordered a number of precautionary steps for his 11th Army, only to bring down Moscow's wrath. A special investigating commission appeared at his headquarters at Kaunas to inquire into the charges that he and his political aide, Commissar Zuvyev, were exaggerating the war threat and creating dangerous tensions. Morozov was compelled to soft-pedal his preparations, but after the task communique of June 13th, he took the risk of resuming them because activity by the Germans was so open and so obvious Daily overflights by Nazi reconnaissance planes, the arrival of more German units on the frontier, the drone of Nazi motor transport day and night, audible at his forward positions. Finally, on June 18th, Colonel General Kuznetsov issued Order No. 1, which instructed his forces to move to a higher degree of preparedness. Morozov summoned his military council and directed the 16th Rifle Corps comprising the 188th, 5th, and 33rd Rifle Divisions, to occupy their forward positions. He gave similar orders to the 128th Infantry Division. The four divisions were instructed to leave only a single regiment, each in the Castle Rudy area, about 30 miles east of the frontier, where most of them had been engaged in summer training exercises since early June. However, the orders came so tardily that, at the moment of the Nazi attack, the bulk of Morozov's troops were still in the training areas. For instance, his 188th Division met the attack with only four rifle battalions and one artillery unit on the line. All the rest were still in the Castle Rudy camps. Simultaneously, Morozov moved his command post from his headquarters in the heart of Konus, an ancient Baltic city of round stone towers and crenellated walls, to Fort No. 6. This fort had been built before World War I at the bend in the Neiman River between Zalyakalnas and Pietrashuni, just east of the old city. It was of sturdy construction designed to withstand heavy bombardment by the World War I Big Berthas. There were reinforced concrete bunkers, underground shelters, and walls protected by 30 to 40 feet of brick and earthen barriers. Morozov felt it should be secure against any dive bombing attack by the Nazis. Fort No. 6 was one of two built by the Tsarist regime before 1914 to protect Kaunas. The other, Fort No. 9, was located about five miles of Kaunas in the Zemaitsk Highway leading to the Baltic coast. Fort No. 9 was even more powerfully built than Fort No. 6, possessing very deep bastions, concrete pillboxes, and heavy gun positions. Despite the excellence of their construction, both forts had fallen almost immediately in World War I. In fact, Fort No. 9 surrendered without ever firing a shot. In the intervening years, Fort No. 9 had been turned into a high-security prison by the Lithuanian government, and it was used for the same purpose by the Soviets when they took over Lithuania in the summer of 1940. Both forts were soon to acquire sinister names. Fort No. 9 became, under the Nazis, the chief death camp in the Baltic region. Arrival of Auschwitz and Dachau here an estimated 80,000 Lithuanians, Jews, Russians, Poles, French, and Belgians were to die in the gas ovens. Fort Number 6 was utilized by the Nazis as prisoner of war camp number 336. Some 35,000 Soviet military passed through its heavy steel gates. Only a handful emerged. A prison hospital was set up at Fort Number 6. In 11 months, from September 1941 to July 1942, 36,473 Soviet prisoners were admitted. Of that number, 13,936 died. At the end of the war, 67 mass graves were found in the vicinity of Fort No. 6, in one of which, according to German records, some 7,708 individuals had been buried. These horrors lay in the future. For the moment, it seemed on June 18th a more wise precaution to General Morozov to move his headquarters to this more secure place, secure not only from Nazi air attack, but from sudden assault from the population. 
Neither Morozov nor his staff were under illusions as to the reliability of Konos in the event of German attack. Manifestations by the Lithuanian nationalists occurred almost daily. Sometimes it was just an old woman caught sewing on a Lithuanian flag. Other times it was a shot in the dark that took the life of a Soviet officer. Major V. P. Agafanov, a communications officer, was occupied all day June 19th installing his equipment at Fort No. 6. Late that evening, Lieutenant Colonel Alexei A. Shoshalsky, Chief of Intelligence, told Agafanov he was concerned about German preparations for attack. Word was circulating that the date had been fixed for Sunday, June 22nd. Agafanov reminded him that there had been earlier rumors of June 15th, but Shoshalsky was not reassured. He pointed out that only that day they had found the communication lines of the 188th Division cut. Agafanov was worried about the safety of his two children, but he was fearful that if he tried to send them to the rear, he would be branded a panic monger. He knew, too, that General Morozov had just sent his own daughter to a summer camp almost on the frontier. On June 21st, Colonel General Kuznetsov came down from his Baltic field headquarters near Penevizes, about three hours' drive due north of Kaunas. He was disturbed about the orders Morozov had given for moving troops into border positions. Moscow was insisting again that nothing be done which might be interpreted by the Germans as a provocation. It was this fear, not worry over the concentration of Nazi divisions, which preoccupied the Kremlin. Aren't you carrying out your concentrations along the frontier too openly? Kuznetsov asked. Don't you think that they are going to smell this out on the other side of the line? If they do, there will be unpleasant consequences. We've done everything possible, said General Schlemmen, Marzov's chief of staff, to assure that our movements will not be noticed. I hear, Kuznetsov said, that ammunition is being provided to the troops. That's correct. Well, Kuznetsov said, be careful with it. One accidental shot from our side may be used by the Germans as an excuse for a provocation. We understand, General Schlemmen replied. Our people have been strictly cautioned. The tall, dignified Kuznetsov and the small, shaven-head Schlem stared at each other a moment. Then Kuznetsov nervously pulled on his gloves, muttering, What a muddled situation, fantastically muddled. He strode off to his car, sat there a moment as though about to say something more then slapped his hand on his knee and drove off. Major Agafanov hurried ahead with his work at Fort No. 6. He labored all day and into the evening, Saturday, June 21st. He was too busy to attend one of the many meetings held that night in almost every 11th Army unit by a special team of political commissars sent out by the Central Political Administration of the Red Army in Moscow. This team was instructed to carry out seminars throughout the 11th Army, assuring troops that war with Germany was not imminent. The exercise had been ordered to dampen down the vigilance and militancy of the 11th Army. Major Agafanov worked well past midnight. There was nothing new from the frontier, all quiet as he knew. He finally got his telegraph, radio, and telephone positions manned and connected. It was nearly 3 a.m. when he and General Schlemmen started for their barracks to get a little rest. They ran into Colonel S. M. Fiersov, chief of engineers for the 11th Army. Fiersov was angry. He had obtained from the Baltic military district a shipment of about 10,000 mines, which he proposed to emplace along the frontier, protecting areas of possible German tank assault. He had started on Saturday laying out the minefields, but the chief of engineers of the district, Major General V. F. Zotov, had ordered him to halt. Apparently, he said with a grim smile, I'm in too much of a hurry. Fiersov put the blame on Zotov. Actually, the orders came from higher up and were part of the effort by Moscow to cool the 11th Army and the Baltic military district in hopes of averting a German attack. A few hopes could have been more vain. Within two hours, Agafanov was routed from his sleep. He raced to the command post deep in the interior of Fort No. 6. Every telegraph, telephone, and wireless receiver was jangling. The enemy has opened strong artillery fire. The enemy is attacking our forward position. Artillery fire on our positions. German tanks are attacking. We are beating off a German infantry assault. One telephone operator threw up his hands. Comrade, Major, I quit. Everyone is swearing at me, threatening me with arrest. I don't know what to do. The training camp at Kosli Rudy was under air attack. 
General Schlemmen made his first report to Colonel General Kuznetsov at Baltic headquarters. All units are occupying defenses along the frontier line. All along the line, the enemy has opened fire. A radio operator reported, No contact with the 128th Division. This was serious business. Major Agafanov set to work to restore communications. Finally, a brief flash came in from the 128th Division. German tanks have surrounded headquarters. Nothing more. General Schlemmen attempted to get through to the 5th Tank Division near Alidus, a key crossing of the Niemen River just north of the 128th Division. The radio operator tried again and again. Niemen, do not calling. Alidus, 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 do not calling. But Alidus did not answer, nor did it answer for the rest of the night. A courier was sent by car to Alidus, 40 miles away. He did not return. General Morozov grew more and more concerned. German tanks are advancing on Alidus, he said. If they seize the bridge there, they will turn the flank of our army. He was pondering the situation when Lieutenant Colonel Sashalsky entered the room. He walked up to Morozov and whispered hoarsely, Vasily Ivanovich, the Germans have broken into the children's camp. The children. What about the children? Morozov asked, his tone still hopeful. I can't tell you, Shoshalsky cried. The children. The tanks. Major Agafanov's children were in that camp. So was Morozov's daughter, Lida. Footnote. In 1944, General Morozov, by great good fortune, found his daughter. She had made her way into Latvia, and there had survived the Nazi occupation. End of footnote. Still no word from Alitos. At 6 p.m. the evening of June 22nd, Major Agafanov himself set out to try to reach Alitos. A few miles out of Konas, he met a blue tourist bus bringing back 20 commanders from a vacation in the countryside. No point in going any further, they told him. Alitos was occupied by the Germans. It was, indeed, Four armored and four infantry divisions, including nearly 500 German tanks, forming the 3rd Nazi tank group of Army Group Center, had smashed across the Newman, splintering the 128th Rifle Division and badly bruising the 126th. The Soviet tank division moving up to protect Alitos was caught in motion and found itself cut off and surrounded. The blow crushed the hinge between the 11th Army and the Central Front and threatened to isolate the 11th Army from its neighbor to the north, the 8th Army. Before nightfall on Sunday, June 22nd, the Germans had secured excellent crossings of the Niemen River at Alidus and a few miles farther south at Mierken. The fate of Konus was sealed. By the time Major Agafanov got back to Fort No. 6, he found that headquarters was being shifted to Kashadoras, about 20 miles to the east. He had two hours to tear out his installations. Before morning, a new system must be operating from Kashadoras. He proposed shifting over to wireless, but this was forbidden. The Germans had captured the staff of the 128th Division, including the commander Alexander Zotov. Presumably they had captured the Soviet ciphers. Wireless was to be used only in the direst necessity. The 5th Tank Division had still not been heard from, and the whole of the 16th Corps was retiring to Janava, 20 miles northeast of Kaunas. The city was being abandoned without a battle. Left behind were the families of the army men, Major Agafanov's among them. The German attack caught the Soviet Air Force in the Special Baltic Military District on the ground. It was, in the words of Lieutenant General P. P. Sobinikov, commander of the 8th Army, virtually destroyed in the first two or three hours of war. Lieutenant General P. V. Rychikov, air commander of the Baltic District, was ordered to Moscow and shot. Lieutenant General of Aviation Kopetz, Chief of the Soviet Bomber Command, committed suicide June 23rd. He had lost 800 bombers to a handful by the Germans. In the first day of war, the Western and Special Kiev military districts lost half their air strength. Soviet losses to 1.30 p.m. on June 22nd were put at 800 by Halder. At that hour, the Nazis had lost 10 planes. The total Soviet loss on the first day was 1,200 planes, 900 on the ground, and 300 in combat. The speed and impact of the German assault had a catastrophic effect on communications within the Baltic Command. Before noon on June 22nd, General Kuznetsov had lost contact with almost all his forward units. Reinforcements were headed for fronts which no longer existed, and were wiped out by German armor, scores of miles from where the enemy was supposed to be found. 
The closer to the frontier, the worse the situation. Footnote. Typically, Colonel General I. Lyudnov, commander of the 200th Rifle Division, was moving his troops on forced march to a concentration point six to ten miles northwest of Koval. About midnight, June 22nd, he heard heavy aircraft overhead. At 3.40 a.m., a flight of 19 German Ju-88s, their black swastikas plainly marked, appeared just north of his column. At about 4 a.m., he heard heavy firing to the west, and five minutes later, nine Ju-88s attacked Ludnikov's 661st Regiment. Ludnikov had no orders. He put his troops under cover and told them not to fire on any planes without special instruction. He got through to 31st Corps about 6 a.m., but his commander, Major General I.A. Lopatkin, had no instructions. All day Lyudnikov waited for orders. None came. End of footnote. The Germans had little difficulty in overpowering individual Soviet units, which they encountered near the frontier. Most of the troops had neither instructions nor battle plans. All they could do was fight back with any weapon that was at hand. At many points in the first hours of war, the only opposition was put up by the paramilitary frontier police, the NKVD border guards, whose nominal commander was Lavrenti Piberia, Stalin's sinister chief of secret police. This was the case in the region just north of Memel, where the Germans crossed the frontier, advancing toward Palanga, key to the Nazi push up the Baltic coast to the port of Leibau. By 6 a.m., Palanga, defended only by the 12th Border Guards, was in flames and battle was raging in the streets. By 8.45 a.m., the 12th Border Guards reported Palanga had fallen and they were retreating. At noon, the 24th and 35th companies of the 12th Guards had been driven back along the road toward Leibau. Up to this time, after eight hours of heavy combat, no regular Red Army units had come to the aid of the border forces. The reason is quite clear. They had simply been wiped out. Soviet historians trying to reconstruct the battle have had little to work with. Destruction of the units was so complete that not even their operational journals have survived. Leibau was the second largest port in Latvia. This was the port which the Baltic fleet commander, Admiral Tributz, considered indefensible because of its closeness to East Prussia, and from which all major fleet units had been withdrawn shortly before the German attack. Colonel General Kuznetsov had reluctantly assigned the 67th Division to defend the city only a few days earlier. Major General N. A. Dediev of the 67th had two regiments, the 56th and the 281st, and a scattering of sailors and coastal artillery at his command. Not until June 21st, less than 24 hours before the attack, had Major General Didyev's artillery commander, Colonel Korneyev, sat down with his naval counterpart, Captain Kashin, and worked out the coordinates for the artillery defense of Leibau. Footnote. Another account gives the date of the meeting as June 20th. End of footnote. Acting on his own, and largely because of nervousness engendered by reports from naval intelligence, Major General Dediev on the evening of the 21st ordered those units of his 67th Infantry, which were not engaged on construction work, most of his troops were so employed, out of their barracks on military exercises. Three battalions moved from town to the banks of the Barta River and set up camp. General Dediev spent most of the evening driving about Leibau and its military installations, trying to convince himself that all was in order. Returning to headquarters in late evening, he heard that Captain Mikhail S. Klevensky, the naval commander, had received a warning from the Baltic Fleet headquarters of possible action that night. Dediev listened to the 11.30 p.m. news from Moscow. There was nothing special. The Spassky chimes played the Internationale. Not until 3 a.m. did a message come through from Colonel General Kuznetsov at Baltic Military Headquarters, alerting all units to occupy forward positions with full field ammunition, prepared for action, but to avoid provocations and not to open fire on overflights of Nazi planes. General Dediev went straight to the naval base and spent an hour with Captain Klevensky, working out a triple system of defense lines around Leibau. It was the first time they had sat down to work out a joint defense plan. On his way back to headquarters, Dediev heard the drone of planes. It was three waves of Ju-88s coming in from the sea. No one fired on them. They swung over the city, suddenly dove, dropped their bombs, and zoomed away. Only then did the Akak guns, protecting Leibau, open fire. 
General Dedyev checked the reports from all his units. It was obvious that the Nazis were driving hard toward Leibau. He telephoned General Berzerin of the 27th Army, his commander-in-chief. Berzerin's answer was curt. Dedyev was on his own. The Germans were attacking on the whole frontier. Hold on with what you have. Fight to the last man. The general sighed. He would do what he could do, but the odds were very long. The situation of the 8th Army was even worse. Lieutenant General P.P. Sobinikov had received the alert from Colonel General Kuznetsov so tardily that many 8th Army units found themselves being attacked by German armored units even before they knew that war had started. Sobinikov's 48th Infantry Division, commanded by Major General P.V. Bogdanov, moving toward the frontier from Riga early Sunday morning, was marching in parade order behind its band in the region of Rasaini. Martial field music filled the air. Suddenly, not knowing that war had started, the 48th Infantry was hit by German attack bombers. A little afternoon, the division was attacked near Erksvilkas by German armor, which had broken through at Turagi. The 48th Infantry had nothing but rifles and hand grenades with which to fight. At 10 p.m., Bogdanov advised headquarters that he had lost 60 to 70 percent of his forces and had run out of ammunition. One of Sobinikov's heavy artillery units, advancing to the front by rail at dawn on Sunday morning, witnessed an attack on the Soviet airdrome at Shouli. The artillerymen saw the German planes, watched the bombs fall and fires break out, but thought it was all a training exercise. Actually, Sobinikov observed, at this time almost all the air force of the Special Baltic Military District was being destroyed on the ground. Within 24 hours of the outbreak of war, Sobinikov reported to Colonel General Kuznetsov, The Army, the 8th, is in a helpless situation. We have no communications with you, nor with the rifle and mechanized corps. I beg you to do all that you can to provide me with fuel. As for what depends on me, I am doing it. The problem of the Soviet command in the first hours of the war was compounded by the fact that at higher echelons there persisted the strange feeling that this might not be war. The commander of the 125th Division was not alone in this. General Fedyunsky, who commanded the 15th Soviet Infantry Corps along the Bug River, had the definite impression that many hours after the German attack, his chief, General M. I. Potapov of the 5th Army, was still not quite sure that the Nazis had started a war. The same atmosphere prevailed at the headquarters of the Special Western Military District at Minsk, where Army General D. G. Pavlov was attending the theater June 21st, when the first reports of an attack came in. It can't be, he said. It's just nonsense. Colonel General Leonid M. Sandilov was chief of staff of one of the armies of Pavlov's command, the 4th Army with headquarters at Kobrin, near the Bug River. Sandilov reported to Pavlov repeatedly during the night of June 21st to 22nd signs of German preparations for attack. The same information had come in from all the frontier points, including the Brest garrison. This information was sent both to Pavlov and to the general staff in Moscow. At 2 a.m., Kobrin and many other points reported interruptions of communications. A fifth column was at work. This information also went to Pavlov and to Moscow. Nonetheless, at 3.30 a.m., Pavlov telephoned the 4th Army commander, Major General A. A. Korobkov that a raid by fascist bands might be expected on the Bug River frontier during the night. Korobkov was ordered to give no provocation, to seize the bands if possible, but not to pursue them across the frontier. Footnote. General Korobkov was removed from his command July 8th and shot a few days later as a penalty for permitting the destruction of his army by the Germans. End of footnote. Pavlov did order the 42nd Division moved up to fortified positions and told Korobkov to issue a general alert. Within the hour, Lt. Gen. V. I. Kuznetsov, commander of the 3rd Army, communicated with Pavlov using the radio since telephone lines had been severed. He reported that the Germans were attacking on a wide front and bombing Grodno. Similar information came from Major Gen. K. D. Kolubev, commanding the 10th Army at Bielestok. Pavlov told his deputy front commander, Lt. Gen. I. V. Bolden, that he couldn't quite make out what was happening. 
With the telephone at Pavlov's headquarters constantly ringing with reports of German attacks, Defense Commissar Tomashenko called from Moscow and ordered Pavlov to take no action against the Germans without prior notification to Moscow. Comrade Stalin has forbidden opening artillery fire against the Germans, Tomashenko said. The confusion grew worse and worse as the day wore on. Unable to get a picture of what was going on at the front, General Bolden proposed to fly to 10th Army headquarters at Bialystok. But the airports had been bombed. No planes were available. He decided to drive despite reports of Nazi paratroop landings. He managed to get to 10th Army headquarters Sunday evening. By this time, the 10th Army had been moved out of Bielstock to escape savage German dive bombing. General Kolyubev reported that his 10th Army had almost ceased to exist. He was unable to get through to forward units and had only occasional communication with General Pavlov at Minsk. It was hard, very hard, Ivan Vasilevich, General Kobolov, told Bolden. Where there is a chance of clinging to something, we hold on. The frontier guards are fighting well, but few of them are left, and we have no way of supporting them. And this is the first day of the war. What will happen next? 